So like I said, uh, it's pretty much almost impossible to really uh, create a succinct short bio for Dr. Apuzo and his many contributions to neurosurgery, but I'm gonna do my best without being too exhaustive and really hit the, some of the key points or else we could be here for 30 minutes to an hour just on the bio. But uh, let's get started. So Dr. Michael L.J. Apuzo is a true neurosurgical pioneer and Renaissance man in the world of neurosurgery. He currently serves as Distinguished Adjunct Professor of Neurosurgery at both Yale Medical School and Weill Cornell Medical College, as well as Senior Consultant for Clinical and Research Activities at the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute at West Virginia University. He's also held several distinguished positions throughout his illustrious career at USC's Keck School of Medicine, including Professor Emeritus of Neurological Surgery and Radiation Oncology, Biology, and Physics, Director of Neurosurgery at the Kenneth Norris Cancer Hospital and Research Institute, Senior Clinical Director of Surgical Neuro-Oncology, Director of the Center for Stereotactic Neurosurgery and Associated Research, and Director of the Gamma Knife and Cyber Knife Facilities at USC, to name a few. Uh, Dr. Apuzo is a native of New Haven, Connecticut, where he completed his undergraduate studies at Yale College. He obtained his medical degree in 1965 at Boston University, and after general surgery training at McGill's Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal, he eventually returned to Yale to complete his neurosurgical residency with fellowships in neurophysiology and neuropathology in 1973. Along the way, Dr. Apuzo has been a decorated leader and innovator both in and outside the field of neurosurgery. Starting in 1968, he served in the U.S., Naval Nuclear Submarine Service Patrols for NATO, during which he received the Atlantic Fleet Admiral's Commendations and the Surgeon General's Award for Distinguished Service. Later in 1977, in association with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, he served as a medical consultant and research scientist during the first Viking project for Mars landing. Dr. Apuzo joined the USC faculty in 1973, where he established seminal laboratories in immunology, cellular biology, and molecular neurosurgery, and pioneered complex uh, transcerebral microsurgical corridors for third ventricular approaches, among other clinical contributions, becoming full professor at USC in 1980. His innovations in minimally invasive neurosurgical approaches are innumerable and span the field of neurosurgery, including the establishment of stereotactic radiosurgery as a treatment modality for brain tumors and AVMs, vagal nerve stimulation as a treatment option for intractable epilepsy, and neuromodulation for neuropsychiatric disease and pain, among his many clinical innovations. His major text atlases include surgery of the third ventricle, brain surgery complication avoidance and management, and surgery of the human cerebrum, each considered foundational texts in neurosurgery. He has amassed more than 800 publications, including 52 edited volumes and 14 monographs on topics related to stereotactic neurosurgery, refinement of microsurgical approaches, epilepsy, brain tumors, and cerebrovascular disorders. He has been a crucial figure in the establishment of all current academic neurosurgery journals, serving on more than 27 scientific editorial review boards. For 18 years, starting in 1991, he held the position of Editor-in-Chief of Neurosurgery, where among other innovations, he championed online publication as a viable medium, with Neurosurgery Online becoming the first principal online neuroscience publication and garnering an international audience in doing so. In 2005, he founded Operative Neurosurgery and eventually became the Editor-in-Chief and founder of World Neurosurgery, publishing its first edition in 2010. Within organized neurosurgery has held several leadership and founders positions, previously serving as president of both the Society of University Neurosurgeons and the, and the American Society of Stereotactic and Functional Neurosurgery. He's also served on the board of directors for the AANS. A devoted educator, he has received numerous accolades in medical education, including the CNS's Founders Laurel Award for contributions to neurosurgical education and the establishment of the Michael L.J. Apuzo keynote lecture on creativity and innovation at the CNS annual meeting. He continues to be an activist in the realm of global neurosurgery education. Outside of the OR and on the field, he has served as the primary neurosurgical consultant to the USC Department of Athletics for over 40 years. In addition, he has served as a special consultant to the NFL, serving uh, as team neurosurgeon for the New York Giants over two decades, during which he has been instrumental in the development of modern neurological assessment of head injury in sports. Over a four, four decade period, Dr. Apuzo's achievements and collective body of work have truly reinvented neurosurgery. Today, he continues to embrace active roles in the mentorship of faculty, residents, fellows, and students, both domestically and globally. We are grateful to have him come speak to our MSNTC audience today of early, uh, of early neurosurgery trainees about his own personal experience within the field and the role of the peer review process in neurosurgery. So without further ado, after the toughest bio I've ever had to put together, uh, Dr. Puzo, the floor is yours. Okay, Sergio, fantastic. You know, I want to I want to begin by uh, complimenting uh, Dr. Daniels on a wonderful talk, 
and uh, certainly uh, it comes with a lot of gravitas to me as uh, uh, he's, he's heading one of the best residency programs in the nation at this point in time. And I would say, I have to say that uh, he serves as a role model uh, for all of you young people in modern times. Uh, when, when Sergio, you know, asked me to uh, uh, participate in this, and I'm just uh, delighted to do it, uh, I, I felt I wanted him to really shape what the content of this was going to be. And uh, I thought it would be better to have, a, you know, a question and answer from him so that we could really shape it according to what he felt you needed to know. And uh, I could just uh, respond, but I want to. I want to begin. He gave me uh, the latitude of, of giving uh, giving a few comments uh, uh, just to begin. Uh, I like history very much, and uh, I like to uh, uh, create a fit of neurosurgery and our times and the times that I lived in uh, into the field of neurosurgery and to learn lessons from it. It's very important from my standpoint to be students of history in every regard. Uh, you know, neurosurgery has a group of epochs. The epochs uh, began in obviously a prehistoric times going over many you know, sort of millennia. And uh, for many years, uh, and neurosurgery fundamentally, uh, the perhaps the oldest of all surgical specialties, had, uh, 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 was largely epidural. It was only until the 19th century when, because of the, the advent of anesthesia and uh, I, and the ideas of, of, of uh, the um, uh, control of uh, in, in infectious uh, processes, that neurosurgery began to move intradurally. So that was a, a long epic. That epic was astoundingly long. Uh, then uh, what happened during, this, during the second half of the 19th century, as neurosurgery began to move in, you know, intradurally, it began to become defined. So it was a sort of a it was a it was a it was a definition that was quite, uh, I believe, uh, you know, nebulous and began to become focused uh, at the first half of the uh, of the uh, uh, 19th century, uh, with uh, Harvey Cushing as he defined uh, the idea of what neurosurgery was. So with that being the case, neurosurgery in now is about 120 years old. Uh, the first half of the of the of the uh, of nineteen hundreds was really Harvey Cushing and Walter Dandy, particularly many people in Europe and elsewhere, but particularly those two began to create what neurosurgery was. And then in the second half of the twentieth uh, of the of the nineteen hundreds, uh, it became it became apparent that neurosurgery uh, began to move. And I've had a long time in neurosurgery. Out of those, out of those now about 120 years in neurosurgery, I've been privy to 60 of them. Believe it or not, it's a long time, and I've had the opportunity to see a lot and to learn a lot. And what I've what I've seen happen is a an escalation of pace when these epics began to become a compressed more and more and more. And uh, I was fortunate to uh, be present uh, during the uh, period where a concatenation of, of, of events and, and forces and opportunities fell into my lap that allowed me uh, to be involved in things that really reinvented neurosurgery between the period of 1970 and the year maybe that 2005. What's happening now is that is that we're in sort of it's I, I think fundamentally and most of us who have seen these things happen think that it's a limbo period right now but ready to have another explosion. So you folks are going to be on this uh, on this uh, involved in this period of when this explosion is going to take place. So I would be ready to have. A lot of change taking place and what we're seeing now is if you're in a good residency program if you come in at a given time by the time you finish the field, the field is going to be significantly different uh, than what it what it had been so so the issue is i 
I do so much mentoring in this point of my career. My career was uh, basically in a number of different sections and uh, basically the first, you know, section of, of being trained and then the section of when I went out and I became a, a young staff man, which was a 20 year section. And during that time, I was a surgeon. I was, pre I was predominantly a surgeon. I had a laboratory in immunology, but I was predominantly a surgeon. I had the benefit of working with one of the great Ted Kersey of neurosurgery. And because of that, certain things fell in my lap. The second part of my, uh, of my, uh, of my career was uh, being an editor. And that was another perhaps 20 year block. But there were certain truisms that were true during the whole period of time and uh, you see that, that when you look at what my contributions have been, what my activities have been, it's sort of like, it's a kaleidoscope, isn't it? I mean, it's a kaleidoscope. And so I, I want to, uh, to, re, to remember that. I was fortunate, I was blessed that things happened uh, and, uh, and uh, they happened for a number of reasons. First of all, I want you to know that uh, I was, uh, I was uh, uh, dyslexic, I stuttered, I had, uh, I had all kinds of problems academically, and I was principally a graphic artist, and I was headed toward architecture. And for a variety of reasons, I ended up in neurosurgery. And so what I did was to take all the weak points and make them strong. So. I would, I would say to you there very quickly before we get into the question, uh, question and, uh, and, and answer, I would say, first of all, know yourself. I think Dr. Daniels sort of alluded to that. You've got to know what your strengths and weaknesses are and you've got to fit yourself so that you can play to your strengths and your weaknesses can be downplayed. Next thing is be involved. Don't be a wallflower whether it's a resident, whether, whether you're a resident, whether you're a young staff person, whether you're a student, be involved, be an activist, because that will be a catalyst for ideas and it will build a fund of knowledge and confidence in you that will carry you through. Third thing, be diverse. Be diverse. Uh, uh, as Dr. Daniel said, you want to be a specialist. And to a certain extent, super specialization breeds being busy. Oddly enough that the more super specialized you get, if you want to be a surgeon, under those circumstances, you will find that you'll get consultations from all over. But at the same time, you also become stale. And what you want to do is you want to avoid boredom. You want to avoid, uh, avoid the... Uh, uh, the sort of wrath of being burnt out. I've seen it over and over again. And I want you to think about that and think of ways to head it off. And one of the, one of the ways of, of doing that is to be diverse in your professional life and in your personal life. As Dr. Daniel said, family comes first. That's what I've learned over all this time. Family comes first, but at the same time, neurosurgery is a, a commitment. As, as you commit to neurosurgery, Within that area, you have heavy focus in what your special, true super specialty is. And then secondarily, uh, you have other elements in neurosurgery that allow you to decompress when you feel boredom setting in. So uh, I would say, uh, and, and the last thing I wanna to say to you is be bold. Don't be afraid to fail. I think one of the big problems I've seen creeping in over the course of of uh, decades is people want to belong desperately. They want to belong desperately. They want to be part of the herd and it becomes a herd mentality in terms of what you do. I have to do this, I have to do that and then I'm going to be accepted into the club. Don't be afraid to fail because, uh, because that was part of, of one of the attributes that I had. Because of the fact that I was not stellar in my academics, I failed a lot. I had problems with failure. That failure made me strong as I began to face things because if I failed, it didn't mean I just would shrug it off. And it wasn't a terrific blow like it would be to somebody who's a perfectionist or such so much of a perfectionist that fundamentally when, when you take a hit in that regard, 
it hurts you. It really hurts you more than it does as somebody who's used to coming back. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing in sports. So as that nice presentation that, uh, that was made to introduce me showed you, I'm jumping around. I want you to think, how did I survive all this time? I'm as excited about neurosurgery now as I was when I was your age. I promise you, I look forward to, to coming to work every day. This time in my career is, is a career where I'm like Yoda, all right, where I, I come to, to Cornell, Dr. Stieg, I met her, I met her Dr. Stieg, all right? I talked, I met her deans, I met her uh, directors of, of, uh, of institutes, but I also, I also mentor students and college students and medical students and so on, and I get joy out of it. One final word before we go on to the questions that I really wanted to leave you with. The, the, the most, the happiest that I am when I look back on my career, look at all, look at everything you heard, is patient care and the patients and the way the patients responded and their families responded in the emotional interplay that I had with them. The second most is my, the people I mentor. And not only the people that went, that became institute uh, directors, okay? There, there are a number of those. There are deans of medical schools. There are heads of departments. I'm very happy and I'm proud, but there are also the people who didn't who didn't didn't take the big shot of, of glamour and what, whatever you want to call it, but they went and they took care of patients and they were great neurosurgeons, uh, and patients benefited from them. Okay, uh, let's let's ask let's start with the uh, questions, please, Sergio. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Apuzo. Um, so. There are so many questions that I could ask and that everyone would probably want to ask. Um, I think I do want to focus them on a couple key things that might be helpful for our students today. Um, so the first one has to do with your, you know, the topic of diverse interests, like you mentioned. So I want to ask, how did your naval experience and working with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory inform your neurosurgical training and career? And off that, you know, how do you think this might apply to current neurosurgery applicants trying to integrate diverse interests and service opportunities within their neurosurgical training? Well, I mean, I think, you know, there are really lessons learned uh, from anything that you do in life. And I, I what, it, it was really an interesting, uh, you know, I love this aspect of my life and could write a book about it. And, uh, and the, uh, uh, the real issue, uh, I'm, I'm a romantic, all right, I'm a romantic very much, and I'm adventure. I like adventure. Oh, you know, I like I like doing things that are that are not ordinary. And uh, I was brought up uh, during the atomic age. I was brought up when uh, the, the 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 business of uh, of, of uh, the Cold War. I was brought up at a, at a time when uh, science was, uh, to a certain extent, worshipped and was had had a romance associated with it. Uh, that being the case, and living 50 uh, miles from the one of the biggest submarine base in the uh, free world, uh, I, I always uh, would see the submarines in Love Island Sound. I would be very much interested in it. It's a very long story, but I'm going to make it short. Yale Neurosurgery had a uh, had had connections uh, with the Navy because uh, for many years, and had had, had connections with the sub base. They were, uh, when the uh, Polaris submarines went into, uh, went into uh, a service, uh, they required that, that would, there would be a prolonged submerged control uh, uh, patrols for uh, four months. And they were looking for people who might be interested and they, they tapped certain people. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, at that time I got tapped and I volunteered and I did, uh, I did my time with, the, with remarkable training uh, that I had. It was one of the best training, the best schoolings I ever had at the postgraduate school for Navy. And so much that I learned, I learned education there. Uh, I learned application of science. I learned rigor of, of discipline. I, I, I really learned 
more courage than I ever thought that I would have. And our patrols went out of Holy Loch, Scotland, and we submerged, uh, uh, we came down to Firth of Clyde, we uh, submerged at the continental shelf and either went under the ice pack, the northern tier of Russia, or more pertinent to now, we went south by the Bay of Biscay through the Straits of Gibraltar, all submerged into the Med, uh, into the, uh, into the uh, 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 western, uh, western part of the Mediterranean, through the Dardanelles, into the Sea of Marmara by Turkey, and then into the Bosphorus and the Black Sea. It's just what you're seeing now on TV, into the Black Sea by, uh, by the uh, southern portion of the Ukraine, and we patrol there submerged uh, with a lot of uh, potential risks for uh, a, a six week period of time until, we, until we, we came out. And the training I had for that, uh, that included becoming a deep sea diver and, uh, becoming, uh, and becoming an officer. Uh, everybody on the, on the boat had to, be, had to be an officer. I had the opportunity to write a syllabus of, of the management of, uh, of closed, in closed head injuries and, and neurological issues that were emergence during uh, prolonged uh, 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 patrols. And uh, that got me some recognition and so on. And uh, uh, I, I learned so much about science that was not related to my residency. I was pegged, pulled out of my residency. And the next thing I know, it's nine months later, I'm in the Black Sea. And I'm, and I'm a participant and I am an important member of a team of, of, uh, of, of 12 officers and 100 and, and, and enlisted men on a nuclear powered submarine with 16 ICBM missiles. And believe me, it was, you know, when I thought of it, it was a shock, but it was very, uh, very inspiring to me about what I learned. And not only that, but the uh, prolonged period of submission and isolation. Now think about all the science. It was the most advanced science there. It was the most expensive vehicle ever built in the history of man. Right, the most expensive vehicle, so much technology on it. And you think about all the technology with navigation. Okay, I'm going to ask you, how did the term navigation sneak into neurosurgery? Because of our navigation on the submarine, I, I brought that in through right. writings and so on into the submarine, and and so much of what we did in terms of of uh, the early uh, navigation packages that we had for stereotaxis came out of our, our, there were various, I don't have time to go through the different navigation modes that we have, but they were so sophisticated that they took the submarine navigation modes, gave them to the astronauts. So part of the first moon landing was based on navigational packages from the submarine. So it was exceptionally sophisticated. All right, so how did then, did I get to NASA? I got to NASA because when I went to LA, I had neurosurgery, I had my submarine experience, I was a diver, I had done isolation, I knew everything imaginable about high tech on those submarines, and they needed people to talk to astronauts, to work with astronauts about isolation and so mm -hmm. on, and to begin to talk about miniaturization. That was a big, big thing miniaturization they had they didn't have enough room on the submarines for all of the all of the uh, uh, all of the equipment that they wanted to have in order to do the job yep. so certainly it was it was this was it was so natural to have that translation take place the lesson from that from everybody you never know what's going what you're going to do where there's cross fertilization is going to take place and there's a paper on that it's called, uh, it's called a, I believe it is a submarine passage through the browsers, the reinvention of neurosurgery. So, and I'm the first author on that. I made myself the first author on that. So it's a great paper, please look at it. So you'll enjoy it. It seems like uh, all the sort of divergent skills that one might think have been, you know, would have been tangential at that point really all diverged or converge together really when it needed to. Just remember when it was, we take it for granted. So many things we take for granted now, and I take for granted. 
you have no you you have no idea uh, how rudimentary it was, and how we flew by the seat of our pants in neurosurgery. I'm sitting here. I, I hope I don't seem like I'm ready, you know, to pack it in, but. When I began, you know, there was no imaging. Imaging came in 1973. That was a huge break and a, and a huge break. As soon as the first EMI scanner, I was there doing something with Bill Sweet at the Mass General at the time. They were putting the first EMI scanner in North America in at the Mass General. A year later, I'm in LA. They're putting the CT scanner next to my, next to my office in the General Hospital of Los Angeles. And that allowed me to make a huge leap in terms of interstitial bracket therapy and so on that I was doing freehand and everything because I was so close, it was so easy to do everything for me. So something a little bit related to that, you know, since we're touching on this. So you've played a direct role in shaping so many technological advancements over the years, really across all subspecialties in neurosurgery. You know, things like the gamma knife and SRS, formalizing the use of the, man, uh, the microscope in neurosurgery, pioneering DNS for intractable epilepsy, and the list really does go on. So what is your approach, what has your approach been to innovation in neurosurgery, and what role do you think research plays in that process? Of course it plays a role. I mean, the trans translation uh, is the uh, translation of what, of, what is, of what is available away from neurosurgery into neurosurgery is so key. And remember uh, that when we begin to talk about new instrumentation being brought in or changes being made in neuro, um, neurosurgery. Uh, the, the reason I want to tell you a little bit about how we got involved in, uh, in uh, radiosurgery. Obviously, I sat, I sat all those months next to a nuclear reactor with 16, nuclear, with, with, uh, with 16 missiles, each of which had, I believe, uh, six uh, nuclear warheads on. All right? I really really was informed about radiation medicine and everything related to a sort of, you know, atomic uh, physics and so on at the time, nuclear physics at the time. So I was really, I was up to speed. So when I came out, what it was, the first thing that was sort of becoming fashionable was interstitial bracket therapy. So I began with interstitial bracket therapy and uh, began to work with that and uh, went to Europe and so on and began to do interstitial bracket therapy. And that's how I got into the uh, imaging directed stereotaxi. taxi. Just incidentally, I stumbled at it at a ski meeting. I stumbled upon it and I was looking and I was active. I was doing something. I stumbled upon a, a, a plastic, a plastic mock-up of the BRW frame. Hmm. All right. And that led to 10 years of work with the University of Utah, 10 years with Trent Wells in his in his in his uh, uh, in his um, factory that I would go to every morning on the way to the general hospital. And and uh, and that led to me doing uh, actually what happened was uh, the people at the Brigham were doing some work. I called them. We had a sort of a, an understanding that uh, that I would uh, that I would be working with Trent Wells because he was right near me and Trent Wells was making their hardware up, so I would see it every morning and we began to talk about it and I began to talk to them. So ultimately, in 1984, we did the first radio surgery in North America uh, because just because we were so close to all the hardware and we can make alterations in it and so on. So what I want to give to the young people. If you're active and you're involved, people come to you. People come to you. How do you think the VNS happened? Because I'm so, because I'm aware of everything that's going on. No, a neurologist walked into my office, right? A guy named Chris DeGiorgio. Chris walked into my office and put it on my desk and I threw him out. I said, this is stupid. This is ridiculous. You know, putting a coil on the vagus nerve to treat epilepsy. Then I, then I went back and I looked at some animal studies and I decided that we would do it. So that's how it happened. How do you think the endoscopes happened? All right? I, because I was, when I was a junior staff, I went, my office was the coffee room for the department. And a person, a person by the name of Milt Heifetz 
who was a really a genius, was working out of the old Cedars Hospital in LA, and he was a genius. And so people were coming to him with different devices and so on, because he was an innovator. So I had ties with him for a variety of reasons. He saw me sitting there depressed, and he said, you know, they brought these Hopkins endoscopes, they're brand new, nobody's ever used them in neurosurgery. They, there's a little bit of work being done uh, in, in uh, GU, but these, these are so new with the, with the light gathering and so on. And he said, do you want to use this? I said, of course. And so that's how we went to work. And, and I, I, I just went to work and it became very innovative how we use them. And so that's why in 1977, we changed the whole, we changed the whole game in terms of, of doing what, what, the, what the endoscope, endoscope work as far as neurosurgery go. So it was that far back. And if you look at that, it went in the JNS as a, uh, as a technical note. I put it in a technical note to get it in and get it out there fast. Mm -hmm. So this is how these things happen. They happen by you, as I said, being active and being ready to take a chance, not being, not worrying about failing, and by uh, and by uh, and by knowing people, and by having always be looking about things that might be relevant to what your tasks are. Yeah, it really seems like the theme that we've been building here is that you know, talent and more importantly, hard work, sort of meeting opportunity. Right, and, and you don't have to be. And you don't have to be a genius, but the point is you have to be, you have to be serious about what you're doing and you have to be bold. There needs to be boldness. And that's what I want to say to all of you. My, my greatest fear is that people want to belong so much to, to a certain way of thinking that it's, that they feel will get them into the club. It's dangerous, and you know, I went to the to the. Uh, I had to go to the Karolinska Institute uh, for uh, for some Nobel stuff that was going on, and that was part of the whole tenor of what our discussion was. And they were they were afraid that what they were seeing and what I was seeing, what I've seen uh, during the course of, of of my time, and even now, is people too anxious to be a club member. All right, so I want you to be, as journal editor, I want you to say, I want you to be very critical. I want you to be original in your thinking. Don't be so quick to really accept what you think, what you think is valid, and it's not necessarily valid. This is, this is an important issue that I want to bring forward to all the young people. Don't think, I'm going to say, because it's in print that it's absolutely valid. It's not. I, I would look at I would look at uh, at three to five thousand manuscripts a year, and we published a lot. And I don't care whether it's JNS or what whatever journal you want to talk about. New England Journal I reviewed for them, all of the science nature. I mean, the issue is all this all of this. Uh, 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 what are you going to say? Uh, a sort of dance goes on about all the reviews and so on. But not what comes out of it is not necessarily ver veritas, but it's the best we can do. It's the best we can do, but. So Dr. Um, Puzo, I think this is a perfect segue into one of the other questions I have. So you, know, you were the founder and the editor in chief of World Neurosurgery and served in primary leadership roles during the early days of neurosurgery. Um, can you give us a flavor of what the neurosurgical journal landscape was like back then, including any oh, politics? That's, that's a great question. That is a great question. I want you to think, think of all the, all the quote, journals there are now. Uh, back in, uh, not so, it's not so long ago. I'm thinking back 1976, okay? Journal of Neurosurgery was it. Hmm. Remember, I mean, I was, and I was, uh, I was uh, really a denizen of the, of the innards of the Journal of Neurosurgery. And one of my patients was uh, Louise Eisenhardt, who was the first editor. Remember, remember Louise's name. And, uh, and I would sit with her, I, I would sit with her uh, in, at the Yale New Haven Hospital, the second year resident, I think, at that time. And, and we would talk about the, being an editor. 
I never thought I would be at it. I was, I was talking about being an editor and so on and so forth. And then Dr. Collins became editor and I was my chairman and I became close to him. He gave me opportunities early on to, uh, to work at, on the editorial board of JNS early. But there were only two, there was only one journal in 1977 with a lot of resistance, I will tell you, a lot of resistance the Congress then founded neurosurgery. All right, so that was that was from I believe it's a nineteen. Uh, what was JNS? It was like nineteen forty-five or something. And then then the next one. So there were only a handful. There was such power in those journals <laughs> because there was nowhere else that people could could go. Mm -hmm. And and then uh, and then fundamentally, I became editor of. Uh, of uh, neurosurgery and uh, the big thing that happened, you know, as we talked about this surgery, it was, it was the issue of the internet. So we jumped on the internet as soon as, as soon as the internet was available, we were the first, uh, we were the first neurological journal for sure. And one of the first handful of journals that was out on the internet. So that really made, made a big change in, both in terms of our income and about what our reach was. And, you know, we 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 went from reaching thousands easily to reaching millions overnight. We were reaching millions of people with that, and that made an enormous change. And uh, and then I had the idea for operative uh, uh, neurosurgery, and uh, and we published that. Uh, I forgot when was it, two thousand and five, but uh, yeah. but the uh, there was. Uh, there was disdain on the part of the uh, leadership of the Congress, and they asked us to put it on the shelf, even though I was I was adamant. I, I said, you know, we really need this uh, journal, but then we, and we and we published it as a supplement. Mm -hmm. But then uh, then uh, Nelson brought it back. But Nelson, you know, I was on his back about bringing it bringing it back, and he did. And so so that's how that happened. And and when uh, when I gave up the, the neurosurgery. There wasn't there, you know. You know the editors can't pub, can't publish anything that they want. There's oversight from the uh, uh, from the uh, sponsoring body, and uh, I really felt that there needed to be a social, political, economic, and educational journal, mm -hmm. right? and it needed to be international, and it needed to have as its goal to really reach the global neurosurgical uh, uh, community. And that being the, that being the case, Peter Black, who was the editor or who was the president of the World Federation, asked me if I if I would help him to create a journal, and we did that. And then he asked me to be editor. I didn't I really didn't want another editor job. Done it for twenty years, but then I did do it. So uh, so that's how that happened. Yeah. But uh, suddenly, with the with the with the uh, uh, with the issue of, of the internet, then all these sort of like pay to play journals began to crop up. And there are so many journals now that uh, frankly, most of them are bogus in my view, you know, as an editor. And I would say for all of you young people, make sure that you take a hard look as to where you're, you're submitting your work and ensure that uh, I would say Go to a mainline, mainline sponsored uh, journal that uh, really has a reputation of, of being a sort of veracity and of people who have editors and oversight from, from the outside. That very, very important. So it, it's very, very important. The other thing that I want to tell you is that if you want to become known in neurosurgery, publish in neurosurgery journals. I hear people complaining, well, they don't know who I am. I mean, but, but, but publish in neurosurgery journals, you'll be famous, right? Maybe you want to publish in science or nature or so on and so forth. Okay, that's fine. But in, in neurosurgery, nobody's going to know who you are. It depends what you want, you know? But, but, but don't expect to be a, a factor or above the noise level in neurosurgery if you're not publishing in the Journal of Neurosurgery, Neurosurgery, World Neurosurgery, and 
and, and then when you get it, once you get into the specialty journals, then you're more and more isolated into another small band of band of brothers and sisters, right? So keep that in mind. Depends what do you want? You know, what do you want? Do you want to pad your CV? You know, Dr. Daniels was talking about about the uh, about how he looks how he looks at, at uh, people at the uh, at the uh, uh, Mayo uh, Clinic and uh, that he does a classic review that is really fantastic and rigorous and so on and it's really what we all want to hear but that isn't necessarily the way people do it overall but I would say you're better off having you know, I think I think the average is what six to eight papers per applicant. And I think that I like to see, I like to see some effort to publish when I'm looking at them, you know, but uh, you would say that there are not a lot of people, to be perfectly honest, who publish in any significant numbers in high quality journals. And most of them, they're hanging on. They're, hang, they're, they're like fourth or fifth author or maybe se second at best. I want to see first author work. Right. Even if there are only two, two or three, rather than ten or fifteen, where they're down the list doing, uh, doing uh, some kind of you know labor work for other people. Right. So quality and quantity are both important in their own ways. Um, so we're sort of at the end of the session here. I think there is one thing that I do you know want to ask you uh, if you can hit on for maybe you know two minutes or so. I know we'll be going a little bit into the resident panel time, but I think it, it's probably important for the students. Um, so can you, can you give any parting lessons before, before we uh, transition for the students in terms of maximizing their productivity or their chances of getting a paper from initial concept to concrete publication? Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to take the way the major issue on a publication is, is it original? Is it original? That will cover a multitude of sins. And most editors will work with you if the idea is an original idea. So that's what that's what everybody's looking for. Jim Rutka, uh, uh, Ed Benzel, Nelson mm -hmm. Shiku, in the major journals. That's what we're, we are, that's what we're we're looking, we're looking for that. Please, please. I'm thinking of, I told you, 20 years, three to 5,000 manuscripts a year. How many, just a handful of original, mm. handful. It's so, it's unusual to have something truly original. I mean, that's where all of us, that's what we're pleading for. That's what we're looking for. So sometimes there's a home run original sometimes there's a kernel of originality so please and i would say when you walk in you young people you walk into the hospital there are ideas all over the place that is a sea it is a sea you're swimming in ideas you go into into the labs of your mentors and so on there are ideas all over the place put your thinking cap on be active be bold Right, be thinking of things you can pull in that aren't relevant. Right. And know, the other thing is know the literature. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of that's gonna, you know, come from understanding the field, right? And so that's where you're really gonna find those niches. Um, all right. Thank you, Doctor uh, Doctor Apuzo, so much for this uh, really insightful and inspiring session. Thank you so um, much. I would tell you, I want to thank you. I've been so honored, and God bless all of you. Everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.